this is Eric Payton, Introduction to Materials, Chapter 2. So in this chapter, we are going to address uh, what promotes bonding, what types of bonding there are, and what properties are inferred by this bonding. Alright, so before we get um, deep into this part of the presentation, I'd like to give you a little bit of, of background about um, previous theories on electronic structure. So the Bohr model, Nels Bohr, uh, described electrons as particles orbiting around discrete energy levels. This is the uh, n number, which is described below. Uh, they're quantized, and they jump from one energy level to the other. but uh, there were many holes in this model, and it couldn't describe certain electronic behaviors. So what came later was Linus Pauling, who introduced the, uh, the orbitals, the model of having electrons in orbitals, and described a wave-particle duality, and he called this the wave function. And electrons move around the nucleus in a standing wave, which has a certain shape to it in a kind of a cloud, but the exact location of the electrons isn't known, but it's described in a probability in a cloud of locations. So um, the n number, which uh, is the principal quantum number, and each electron has a principal quantum number. And it, uh, it's originated from the Bohr model, um, and it's really related to the distance from the nucleus. So within each principal energy level, there is a subshell. Now, the subshell uh, is the type of orbital for each of the principal quantum numbers. So it's the type of orbital. It describes the shape of the electron cloud. And, uh, for example, um, S, the uh, S subshell is round. The P subshell is tahedral shaped. It's like tying uh, three balloons together, and that's what the shape, I'm sorry, four balloons together, and that's what the shape would look like. Uh, so for the, for the S level, you have um, 1S, 2s, 3s, etc. And uh, for the p orbital, you have um, 2p, 3p, and so on. Um, so the d and f suborbitals get a lot fancier, and uh, the m sub l is the number of energy states within each, each subshell. So the s orbital has one energy state. The p uh, suborbital has three energy states. The d suborbital has five energy states. So that's m sub l. So m sub s, this becomes important when you have a man magnetic field uh, that's applied to the subshell. And each energy state has two electrons designated spin up and spin down. So there are two electrons per energy state. So that is something to remember later when we start filling up the, um, the energy shells. So question, how many electrons are there in a filled P orbital. Well, a p orbital has three energy states, and if each energy state has two electrons, one spin up and one spin down, then you have three times two or six electrons total in the orbital. Well, how about D, the D subshell then? How many electrons does that have in it? All right, well, it has uh, five energy states, and, and each energy state can 
have up to two electrons, so a filled D state would have five times two, or ten total electrons. Okie doke. So here is a first glimpse of a periodic table. So we've all seen the periodic table, we've all taken uh, beginner chemistry. Um, but what I'd like to know is, is, is how, how the heck did they decide to arrange the periodic table like this? And it was a guy named Mendeleev that arranged it like this. And um, he, he was a Russian, and um, at the time there were about 60 elements known at the time. And they were all um, sorted by atomic weight. So, but the way that that was sorted didn't, didn't make sense when he was trying to look at the reactivity between different atoms and, or uh, elements. And so they were sort of just spread all over the place when it came to the reactivity. So in order to find, um, to arrange it so that there was some sense out of, the, out of that, he found that he could arrange it uh, where he had reactivity and atomic weight uh, arranged here, and it led to a periodic repetition, hence the periodic table, uh, of every seven elements for the first three rows. And um, what he didn't know about was the eighth uh, element, which were the noble gases, because they were hard to find. Um, so it repeated every seven uh, elements. And uh, so the electrons fill up the shells from left to right, top to bottom, and each element has one more electron than the previous one. So we've got one electron here, two electrons here, three here, and four here, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. And two of those, and eight of those are in the same shell, and two are from the previous shell. All right, so that sums up the periodic table. Um, so this is something that you might want to put on your cheat sheet or memorize or whatever, but it's like a, a sort of a form that you use, and you fill the spin-ups and the spin-downs, uh, the electrons from bottom to top, because this is the lowest energy, and this goes higher and higher in energy state, and it tends to occupy the lowest available state. So from top to bottom, and we'll get back to that uh, in just a minute here. So let's take a survey of the elements. So the um, electron configuration for most elements are not stable and only the noble uh, electrons are the stable ones. And so those are listed here. You got helium, neon, argon, and they're all in the far, far right on the periodic table. And they have completely filled uh, electron shells. So they are happy and they don't need to do anything. So the green ones that are highlighted here, these are all the valence electrons. So the valence electrons are extremely important because they participate in bonding between atoms, hence their uh, physical and chemical properties are also uh, um, uh, dependent on their valence electrons. So back to the noble gases. Uh, you don't uh, find, you don't typically find pure elements in nature except the noble gases because of course they're just happy campers just being left to themselves and they are found uh, naturally in nature. Um, they don't bond to each other so let's talk for a moment for a minute about atomic number. So what is the atomic number? Well that's listed here in, in the second column here and it is simply the number of uh, protons. Uh, it's also the number of neutrons and the number of electrons. So that's the atomic number. So we got one electron for 
hydrogen and we got one neutron and one proton. So then you go higher as you go down the periodic table. And uh, the atomic mass is the protons plus the average number of neutrons on Earth. So the proton mass is 1.6726 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. So multiply that by the total number of protons and you get the, uh, the total mass of the sample. So uh, in comparison, um, the proton is 1,837 times heavier than the electrons. And that's why the atomic mass is based on the number of protons, because they are so much heavier than the rest of the, the element, the atom, sorry. Okay, so that moves us next into electron configurations. So this is an example of carbon. So the uh, 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. The valence electrons are highlighted in red here. And there are, are two electrons in the, in, the, in the 2s and two electrons in the 2p. Um, total of four electrons, but an atomic number of six because there's also two in the subshell. So the um, the filled shells, as we know, they're stable. They're they're more stable, and the valence electrons are mostly available for bonding and tend to control the physical and chemical properties. So with four electrons here, but only two of them are are unpaired. Uh, so what this looks like to me is that we only have two sites for bonding. Uh, do you think that's true for carbon? Well, we're going to find out later that it's not true, uh, that carbon actually has four available bonding sites. And we're going to come back to that when we talk about sp hybrid bonds later. OK, so earlier I showed you the um, the form that you fill out uh, for the um, electron uh, configuration, and uh, I'll show you an animation of that now. Okay, so let's take uh, iron as an example. What's the atomic number for iron? Well, we look it up. Uh, the periodic table will be provided to you, so the atomic number is 26. So if there's 26 for the atomic number, that means there's 26 electrons. So let's start filling up the energy levels here. Um, there's your 26 electrons, your spin up and your spin down in your 1s, your spin up and your spin downs, all the way up to 4s, and there you have your unfilled 3d which can normally take up to 10 electrons. In this case, we have six available. So what's the number of valence electrons? And what are they? So the valence electrons are the six in the 3d orbital and two in the 4s2 orbital. So there you have it. Okay, we are back with the periodic table, and the periodic table is divided up into columns, uh, similar valence for every element in the column, in that column. So the 1A group is on the far left here, and that uh, gives up one electron. The, the 2a gives up two electrons. And this uh, 3b gives up three electrons. So on the right hand, you have your inert gases, and they're just happy the way they are. So no electrons 
are given or accepted, and you have the uh, 7As which accept 1 and the uh, 6A which accept 2. So on going to the right here, we have um, higher electronegativity or more electronegative elements, which means they readily acquire electrons and uh, to become negative ions. And on the left side of the periodic table, excuse me, they are um, more electropositive and they readily give up electrons to become uh, positive ions. So just uh, in summary here, each group has the same number of valence electrons and uh, the atomic number, which is written down, written above the element name here, is um, is written here. So earlier we had iron, which had an atomic number of 26, um, and the group numbers, which are basically define each of these columns. So let's look at some of these some of the names of these groups. Um, the halogens. Well, the halogens are right here. It's the fluorine, the chlorine, the bromine, iodine. Uh, these accept one electrons because those are called halogens or the 7As. The alkali and the alkali earth metals are on the left side. Those are the transition, I'm sorry, those are the uh, 1As and the 2As. So those give um, give up the electrons. Those are the alkali and the alkali earths. Um, in between here, you have what we call the transition metals. So in in layman's talk, we, you know, we call these metals, uh, iron, chromium. These are all called metals, but on the periodic table, they're called transition metals. So it's group 3B through group. So from here to... Um, the right side, which is the 2B, zinc, chromium, cadmium. Um, then you have the metalloids, which are very confused elements, and they can't figure out if there are metals or non-metals. So that is powerful because we can make them uh, be either. And those are the um, intermediates, the, or metalloids, we call them, and uh, the bromium, um, carbon, silicon, germanium, arsenic, all of these. So um, these, uh, and then the ones in the far right, the inert metals, those are um, the noble metals, and then all other elements just aspire to be like the noble metals. Uh, they want to just have all their electron states satisfied, and they'll do whatever they can to give up or accept or steal or share electrons to become noble, just like the others. So um, let's just take um, sodium as an example of one element that is really, really unstable um, by itself as a metal. Um, and um, it's much easier for it to give away one electron than it is to find seven from somewhere else. And that's why it just it tends to just give up an electron instead of trying to find seven. On the other hand, you have chlorine here on the opposite side. We all know table salt, sodium chloride. Um, it is much easier for chlorine to accept uh, just one electron than it is to try to find homes for seven of its own. And that's why it will just accept one. It's much easier for it to do that. Um, so that is why Chlorine and the others here are more electronegative, which means they readily acquire electrons. Okay, so that means electronegativity, or the tendency to acquire electrons, or how badly the atoms want to hog electrons, um, goes um, from left to right is more electronegative, and from bottom to top, more electronegative.
electronegative. And these are the electronegativities in red here. And you can sort of just by looking at these numbers, you can see those trends here. More electronegative this way and less electronegative this way. All right. So, um, oh, and so why is the trend becoming less electronegative as you go down the periodic table? Well, as you go further from the nucleus, the valence electrons are shielded by these, like, by these d orbitals, um, these, you know, giant complex clouds of electrons that, that shield them, and that also means that, that they're just further from the nucleus. So, uh, that is why they're less electronegative further down in the table. So now we can start talking about bonding. Now that we have a basic understanding of the periodic table and how electrons accept or give away, uh, we can go into bonding. So there's several types of bonding. The first type is ionic bonding. The ionic bonding is a bonding between a metal and a nonmetal. Earlier, I showed you the periodic table where the metals were on the left-hand side of the periodic table and the nonmetals were on the right side of the periodic table. And as we know, donates, uh, the metals will donate electrons, the nonmetals accept the electrons. So you have a large uh, difference in electronegativity here, which means it tends to be ionic bonding. Uh, here's an example. You have magnesium oxide. Um, it has two valence electrons, and those um, will be donated to the nonmetal, and that way the nonmetal can satisfy and fill up its p orbital, and then the um, magnesium has a full p orbital, uh, 2p6, from previous um, here. So that's how it's an example of magnesium oxide. So further on ionic bonding, uh, it occurs between positive and negative ions. Uh, it requires electron transfer, and there's a large difference in electronegativity required. An example is sodium chloride. Sodium is the nonmetal, chlorine is, I'm sorry, sodium is the metal, chlorine is the nonmetal. They're both highly reactive in their pure state, but when they combine, it becomes very stable, and you can eat it. Um, and uh, you get what we have here called columbic, columbic attraction, where the positive and the negative uh, attract, and uh, you have the electron sharing. Okay, so... Now, um, let's go into the atomic bonding uh, in further detail. Um, actually, this is a good place to stop. Let's look at atomic bonding uh, a little bit differently. This time, we're going to be showing you a graph of potential energy versus interatomic separation. So, uh, above zero, that's positive, that's, those are repulsive forces, and negative is attractive forces. So, the green line is the energy of the repulsive forces. So, um, two atoms that you bring too close together, uh, they just don't want to be that close because now the atomic, the uh, electron clouds will start to interact with each other and you have a very large uh, repulsive term and uh, it, it increases dramatically here as R decreases because of this N term here. Uh, this um, N term is approximately equal to 8. 
So uh, the repulsive energy drops off much sooner with, di uh, with distance. And um, as you get closer to the nucleus. And um, by the way, A and B here are constants. And uh, the, um, there is a nice equilibrium between the attractive forces and the repulsive forces where um, the atoms tend to maintain separation. So they like to be close, but not too close. So this is the nice equilibrium state here where it achieves the lowest possible ener energy state. The second law of thermodynamics it always wants to be at that lowest possible energy state. So back to ionic bonding, let's look at a few examples of ceramics that are mostly ionically bonded. So sodium chloride um, gives up one electron and on the sodium side and the chlorine, the group 7As all um, acquire one electron. And uh, then in the next column over, you have magnesium, which uh, gives up two electrons. And on the oxygen side, on this column, they will acquire two electrons. Any of these elements in this column will acquire two electrons. So then you look at the um, calcium fluoride where it, um, it gives up one electron from the calcium, but it will, from the fluorine, it only acquires one electron, so you need two fluorines for, um, for a chemical balance there and charge neutrality. So uh, cesium chloride here, it gives up one electron from the cesium, and the chlorine accepts one electron. So those are some examples. Uh, let's talk about covalent bonding next. So we've just discussed ionic bonding. Now we're going in, into covalent bonding. The difference between the two is uh, in covalent bonding, you have a sharing of electrons as compared to ionic bonding where they were giving or taking electrons. So for covalent bonding, this typically occurs where you have similar electronegativities. It means there's no preference for giving or taking electrons, so they tend to just share them. Uh, the bonds are determined by the valence. So uh, the s and p orbitals dominate the bonding in this case. Here's an example, a very simple example, hydrogen. Hydrogen gas, H2. Um, each hydrogen has one valence electron, and it needs one more to, uh, to satisfy its, its energy state. Uh, electronegativities are obviously the same, because it's the same atom uh, element in both cases, so they share those electrons together, and you have this covalent bonding for H2. Uh, uh, you can you might want to consider water as the second example. All right, water is something that uh, also covalently bonds, and um, but it also has polarity in the way that the bonds come together. So that will be in a homework uh, problem for that one. Uh, bond hybridization is uh, something that uh, that uh, typically occurs, like in carbon. It forms a tetrahedron type of uh, arrangement. We call this the sp3 hybridate hybrid bond. Um, when you look at carbon, it has six six uh, electrons, so it fills from from bottom to top. It has you go higher energy, and you have one completely unfilled and two partially uh, unfilled. What ends up happening is, is you get a promotion of uh, the 2s orbital into the pro uh, promotion into the 2p, and instead of having um, these two separate uh, orbitals here, you have this hybridization, and it's called sp3 hybrid hybridized orbital here. So. Um, a little bit more on carbon, uh, covalent bonding of carbon in sp3. Example here is CH4. Uh, 
carbon that has four valence electrons. It needs four uh, more to satisfy. And uh, hydrogen has one valence electron available, um, and, the, and it needs one. So uh, there's sharing going on at each of the four corners of this tetrahedron, and uh, they can both uh, get their bonds satisfied. Uh, Again, um, uh, this is a nonpolar covalent bond, by the way. Uh, for water, you can have a polar covalent bond. Um, so I haven't spoken yet about metallic bonding. Uh, I'm just summarizing it here because it's, it's mo one of the most simple type of bonding arrangements. Uh, because you have a delocalization of the electrons, or what we call a C of electrons, there's never any polarity. Um, the electrons just float around everywhere, and uh, so all of the elements in the transition metal area are typically metallic bonding. So electronegativities are all very similar in the um, transition metal area. All right, so we've talked about covalent, ionic, and, um, and metallic bonding. Um, another type of bonding is secondary bonding. And these are, this type of bonding is much weaker than the three that I spoke of previously. Um, and uh, secondary bonding can occur when you have fluctuating dipoles. I mentioned earlier how you can have uh, water that is that each of the water molecules is has a polarity to it, and uh, so so water molecules will attract to other wa other water molecules. Same goes for um, liquid hydrogen. You can have um, um, polarity within these two hydrogen bonds and these two hydrogen bonds, and uh, as the um, the cloud is fluctuating here, you might get secondary bonding to occur there. Um, also, you have permanent dipole mo uh, molecule induced bonding. Um, if you have like a ionic, ionic bond where uh, sodium and chlorine, you have a much larger electron cloud. If you take one uh, sodium chloride compound and bring it close to another sodium chloride uh, compound, you can get secondary bonding to occur here. Uh, also, uh, another example is hydrogen chloride, uh, more likely to occur because they're in a liquid state. So um, you might get secondary bonding in that case. Uh, also, you have um, secondary bonding in polymers. Haven't talked about polymers too much, but I'm just going to touch on this. Polymers are long, long chains of hydrogen-carbon bonds. But um, so along the chains, the uh, bonds are very strong because that's covalent. But between the chains, you might have some uh, weaker bonding uh, between them, and that's the secondary bonding that's occurring there. OK, so in summary, types of bonds are ionic, covalent, metallic and secondary. The bonding energy for ionic is very, very large. Um, so ceramics is, is an example of ionic bonding. These are non-directional bonds. Uh, covalent bonding is um, bonding energy is variable. For example, with diamond, the, the bonds are very, very strong. Uh, bismuth, on the other hand, bonding is very, very weak. Another um, um, characteristic of covalent bonding is the bonds are directional. Um, examples are semiconductors, some ceramics, and polymer chains. Metallic bonding, uh, bonding energy, again, is variable. For example, tungsten, the bonding energy is very high. For mercury, it's very low. Uh, as you may know, look at the melting temperatures between tungsten and mercury are very, very large, and that's um, also related to the bonding energy, which we'll discuss a little bit later.
secondary bonding, the uh, bonding energy is the smallest, and uh, the um, you might have interchain polymer bonding or directional bonding uh, between like water molecules. All right, so Tm is the melting temperature. So the properties of bonding uh, are highly uh, dependent on melting temperature. So um, if you look at uh, the bond length here, uh, consider two atoms connected by a spring. They're oscillating back and forth. And the higher the temperature, the faster these atoms vibrate or oscillate. So in order to um, break that bond, and uh, which is basically uh, synonymous to the, to the melting of the metal, um, you have to um, get out of this well. So the more the atom can vibrate inside this well, at some point, uh, it's going to vibrate uh, enough to release itself from the well, and that will cause the bond break. So looking at two graphs here, the black graph is uh, synonymous with a very high melting temperature in metal, and blue is a lower melting temperature uh, material. So it uh, makes sense here. We have a deeper well here and requires more energy to, um, to remove itself from the, from the deeper well, thus a higher melting temperature. Uh, Okie doke. So next slide is properties uh, from bonding. All right, so uh, there's a, um, about, uh, something here called coefficient of thermal expansion. It's a property of the material, just like uh, melting temperature is a property of, of the material. Coefficient of thermal expansion alpha is, um, again, just a uh, relation of the amount of change in the length of the material uh, for a given change in temperature. So when it's unheated, it's going to have a length L0. As soon as you heat that up, the length is going to increase because you have m more vibration and the atoms are moving further away from each other. That's going <coughs> to macroscopically translate into a longer piece of metal. So the ratio of delta L over the original length, L0, that's equal to alpha times the change in temperature between the unheated and the heated. So uh, alpha is larger uh, if E is smaller. So um, easier E, uh, the blue line is going to have a larger alpha and uh, the black is going to have a smaller alpha. So consider the kind of the width of the well here and the vibration. The, um, the atom can only vibrate um, this distance here, the x distance between the two sides of the well. However, on the blue graph, the uh, sides of the two um, uh, energy lines here are further apart. That means the atoms can vibrate more, and that's going to equate to a larger coefficient of thermal expansion. All right, so in summary, three types of, of bonds. Primarily, you have uh, ceramics, uh, sorry, three types of materials. You have ceramics, metals, and polymers. Ceramics are either ionic or covalently bonded, and they have a, uh, a large bonding energy which um, means they have a large melting temperature, they have a large elastic modulus, and they have a small coefficient of, of thermal expansion. Uh, metals, on the other hand, are uh, metallic bonding, and that's the sea of electrons. They have variable bonding energy, so they have moderate melting temperature, moderate elastic modulus, and moderate um, coefficient of thermal expansion. Polymers, on the other hand, are either covalent or secondary, and the, um, they do have directional properties, so like 
in, if the long chains are lined up with the direction of force, you might have very strong uh, polymer properties. Um, if it's uh, along the transverse direction, uh, might have very, uh, very small uh, melting temperatures. I'm sorry, uh, very weak properties, but in general they all have uh, small melting temperatures, uh, small elastic modulus, and a large alpha. And that wraps up the presentation uh, for today. Uh, if you have any questions about the slides, we'll see you in class and answer any questions. Thank you and have a good day.